So let's talk about sampling for in-depth interviews. Now, let's say that we have a question that we believe would be best answered with data we could collect through in-depth interviews. If this is the case, then the first thing we need to think about is sampling. Sampling is a selection of particular cases that can validly inform us about the larger phenomenon from which the sample is taken, which we call the population. In the case of in-depth interview studies, the cases that we sample are individuals we can interview to collect data that we can use to answer our research questions. For instance, if I'm interested in collecting information about how registered sex offenders manage their stigma in everyday life, the population of interest would be registered sex offenders, and the sample would be all the registered sex offenders I actually interviewed for my research. Why is sampling important? Well, for one, we can't collect data on all the cases in which we are interested. The vast majority of the time, it would take too much time, too much effort, and too much financial resources to collect data on all the cases in which we are interested. In other words, it would be near impossible to collect data on the entire population in which we are interested. Because we often can't collect data on all the cases in which we are interested, we often have to collect data on just a subset of the cases in which we are interested. In other words, we have to sample. And it is the hope that the sample can help us find out information that we can use to create generalizable knowledge that goes beyond the sample itself. Most research projects in social science have some sort of sampling design. Sampling design is the part of the research design that indicates how the researcher selects cases to include in a sample. It is always very important to be as explicit as you can be about your sampling design in the write-ups of your research projects, since this gives readers a way to judge the validity of the knowledge claims that you will make. It is also very important to come up with a viable and valid sampling design before you actually start collecting data, since figuring out how to go about sampling cases is much easier to do up front than it is while you're doing your research. And sampling designs in the social sciences can be broken up into two general types, probability sampling and purpose of sampling. Probability sampling is a sampling technique in which cases are selected at random and there is a known probability of a particular case being selected into the sample. Random selection refers to the process that gives each case in a target population an equal chance of being selected into the sample. If for whatever reason the selection of cases to be included in the sample isn't random, that is there are cases that don't have a chance to be selected into the sample, or there are cases that are absolutely going to be included in the sample, then the sample isn't really random. There are several reasons we do random sampling for probability samples. For one, it helps protect against sampling bias, which can lead to samples that lead to incorrect conclusions about the phenomenon in which we are interested. When not every case has an equal chance of being selected in the sample, then this bias occurs. For instance, just say that I just sampled everyone taking this class for a study and use that information to make claims about the U.S. population in general. Just choosing everyone in this class, of course, is an example of a convenience sample. And it's not random because not everybody in the population in which I'm interested, i.e., the U.S. population has an equal chance of being in my sample. If you are not in this class right now, you would have zero chance of being included in my sample. And if you're in this class, you have 100% chance of being in my sample. 
Now the logic behind random selection is this. If you choose enough cases at random, the sample will closely represent all of the cases under investigation, at least empirically. With a random selected sample of the U.S. population, for example, you'll have the same percentages of men and women, blacks and whites, college educated versus non-college educated, etc. in the sample as exists in the overall population, more or less. Probability sampling is used mostly in survey methods. All of the major surveys that exist, such as the General Social Survey, the World Value Survey, uh, the Fragile Family Survey, Add Health, use random selection in some way, shape, or form to choose individuals to be in their samples. Now, what types of generalizations are made from probability samples? Well, probability samples give you statistics that estimate parameters. A statistic is an estimation of a parameter, and a parameter is a characteristic of the population. Parameters are rarely, if ever, known. That's why we calculate statistics. If we knew the parameter, we wouldn't need to calculate a statistic. For instance, say that we want to find out if in the U.S. adult men on average make higher salaries and incomes than adult women. The parameter would be the average gender differences in salaries and incomes between all adult men and women in the U.S. And the statistic would be the average gender differences in salaries and incomes between the adult men and women in a probability sample. In short, we can calculate statistics from our sample to make generalizations about all the cases in which we are interested. Probability samples tend to be large because, as you will learn when you take your statistics classes or quantitative methods classes, if you haven't already, the larger the sample size, the better it will actually represent the population of interest. The second main type of sampling design is purposive sampling. Purpose of sampling occurs when the researcher samples cases not at random, but rather with a particular research goal in mind. The vast majority of qualitative social science research projects, including in-depth interview projects, use purpose of sampling. Studies that use purpose of sampling usually have small samples, unlike studies that use probability samples. A good probability sample might be around 500 cases. A good purpose of sample might be around 50. The big difference between probability samples and purpose of samples is that while probability samples are driven by being empirically representative, purpose of samples are theory driven. When a sample is theory driven, the researcher selects cases that will help her answer a particular theoretical question, whatever that may be. However, probability samples are empirically driven in that their main goal is to have the sample be empirically representative of the population of interest. Theory driven purpose of samples cannot be empirically representative of a population. Only a probability sample can actually be representative of a population because the cases included in the sample are chosen at random. In-depth interviewers use purpose of samples because they want to develop a theory about some social experience or some social process or some particular type of social action. And to do this, they try to sample the individuals that have had the social experiences have experienced these social processes or acted in ways in the social world that are of interest to the researcher. And because of this focus, the sample isn't chosen at random, but rather purposely selected for those who can provide data to help answer the theoretical question. The theory driving the sampling and purpose of sampling can occur either before data collection begins or during the process of data collection, and often both occur. 
For instance, I could tell you up front I wanted to interview sex offenders who were convicted of different types of sex crimes because I can anticipate that some sex offenders, such as uh, pedophiles, would have a tougher time managing their stigma than other types of sex offenders, such as a person convicted of statutory rape when uh, he was 18 and um, the victim was 17. However, let's say after I completed a few, uh, few interviews, I come to the conclusion that I want to sample some sex offenders who have children. Since the interviews I've done make it seem that having children makes it especially difficult for sex offenders to deal with their stigma. That, and that would be something I, I did not anticipate, didn't even think about when I began, right? But it came up. I want to start sampling for that. In other words, purpose of sampling is a very flexible type of sampling, which is beneficial because this allows researchers to follow new leads that will help develop theory and sampling in ways that they did not at first anticipate. This is unlike probability sampling, where those chosen to be in the sample are determined before any data collection begins. Because you are trying to answer a theoretical question using purpose of sampling, you have to think about sampling in an abstract way. That is, don't think about sampling certain types of people or certain types of sites, but rather think about sampling certain types of experiences that are important for answering your research question. And then choose particular types of people or sites that have had, that have had these experiences. For instance, Let's say I'm interested in studying how people deal with having a stigma or a characteristic that makes others judge them quite negatively. Now, I wouldn't want to go out and just start interviewing people who have a stigma of some kind. Rather, I want, would want to first think about how having a stigma can be different on a sort of a general abstract level, because that might influence how people cope with the stigma. For instance, one big difference is in stigma is that some are readily apparent. We know, know them when we see the person, while others are easily hidden. We wouldn't know it unless they told us or someone else told us. Now, as you can imagine, having a stigma that is out in the open versus one that is hidden will probably influence how people cope with their stigmas. Thus, if I wanted to do a study like this, I would want to sample people who have hidden stigmas and those who are out who have stigmas that are sort of out in the open and then i would start choosing i would think about well what types of people have a hidden stigma well you know uh, child molesters you know convicted child molesters you know unless somebody told you or they told you you wouldn't know that and so you know or you know people who have a uh, psychiatric uh difficulties uh what about out in the open stigmas right those with, uh, you know, t uh, unfortunate physical deformities or, you know, um, or body mutilations or something like that, right? And then I would sample them. And then I could use that to compare on sort of the theoretical level of stigma. Now, you may be asking yourself, why don't in-depth interviewers simply use probability samples? Would that be a more legitimate way to sample for an in-depth interview study? Well, there are three reasons why in-depth interviewers don't tend to use probability sampling designs. First, to do a probability sample, you usually have to have some sort of list of the individuals that you can include in your sample to draw from. For the types of people in-depth interviewers are in tend to be interested in interviewing, such a list does not exist. Second, the subjects of in-depth interview studies are often rare and hard to find, and thus doing a probability sample would be impractical, if not impossible. For instance, it would be very difficult to do a probability sample of members of the Aryan nation because so few of these individuals actually exist in the overall population. Not to mention that you probably won't find a list of, this, of the members of this population. Third, in-depth interviewers use purpose of sampling because it gives them more leeway in who they can sample than probability sampling does. In a probability sample, those that will be included in the sample 
is determined before data collection begins. And this limits the people that can be included in the sample. However, the main goal of in-depth interview studies is to develop theory. And often the people you'll need to interview beforehand to develop a good theory can't be determined beforehand. Overall, who you choose to sample in a purpose of sample depends on the study's substantive frame. The substantive frame is the set of topics that one wants to explore with a particular study. Substantive frames are often modified, changed, and honed as in-depth interview studies progress. This is because new theoretical questions that we can answer often emerge as a study progresses. That is, you find stuff you didn't expect or weren't looking for at, uh, in the beginning. In my mind, this is one of the great things about qualitative social research, like in-depth interviewing, the sort of emergent and surprising nature of the things you'll find once you begin your research. I'll use a personal example. In my research on religion and the experience of intimate partner violence, I found that many of the victims I initially interviewed kept telling me how they used prayer to help them manage the negative emotions caused by their abusive experiences. Now, this wasn't something I necessarily expected to find or went in to find, but I ran with it, so to speak, and started asking uh, subsequent participants questions about if and how they used prayer to manage negative emotions. And I used this data to come up with a theoretical explanation for how prayer helps people manage emotions. Substantive frames can be divided into two types. The first is finding out about an organization, institution, group, subculture, or culture. And the second is finding out how people experience a particular event or situation. These substantive frames can overlap quite a bit often. Like, say, if a researcher is interested in how people who worked at the U.S. Capitol dealt with the insurrection that happened in uh, 2021. Now, to find out about an organization, institution, group, subculture, or culture, one needs a panel of knowledgeable informants. A panel of knowledgeable informants is individuals who witnessed or have expertise regarding a particular organization or institution or group or subculture or culture. An important point when sampling a panel of knowledgeable informants is that you want to make sure to talk to people of varying statuses and levels of power within the organization, group, subculture, or culture. This is because the people in power often want to portray a particular image. And if you just talk with them, you'd come away thinking this image is perhaps how things are. However, often talking to the people of low status can tell you a lot about what is really going on, or at least, at the very least, they can give you a different viewpoint that you can compare contrast to other viewpoints, right? So let's say you're, you're interested in studying a heart surgery clinic and how it functions day to day. Of course, you'd want to, you know, talk to the physicians, the surgeons, right? The uh, the, the people in charge, the the uh, upper administration of it. But that's not all you'd want to talk to, right? You'd want to talk to people in that organization who are of lower status, right? The nurses, right? Um, the orderlies, the janitors. Um, administrative staff, right? Yeah, and you, perhaps even patients, patients' families, right? To get that broad sense of what is actually going on. And to find out how people experience a particular event or situation, one needs a sample of representatives. A sample of representatives is a sample of participants who represent on the whole the experiences of a larger group. 
A good example of this would be a study of people who live with STDs. This is a group of people, often who don't know one another, who share a similar experience, i.e. living with an STD, and thus represent the experiences of such people. Another example is victims of intimate partner violence. Many people experience intimate partner violence and they often don't know one another. When you use a sample of representatives, you want to sample usually in a way that gives you all the variations that you can think of regarding particular experiences. In other words, you try to achieve a sample that will provide you with a maximum variation of experiences. For example, in my own research on religion and intimate partner violence, I tried to sample victims from a variety of religious backgrounds so that I might see any variation in experiences between, say, evangelical Protestant victims, Catholic victims, etc. When you sample, when you use a sample of representatives, you often want to sample what we call theoretically important cases. Theoretically important cases are cases that provide you with data that helps extend and or hone the theory you're developing from your in-depth interview data. For instance, say I'm doing an in-depth interview study to develop a theory about how people experience the process of exiting a role, such as leaving the, leaving the student role when one graduates from college or leaving the spouse role through divorce. Given that I'm interested in theorizing about the process of role exit, I would want to sample theoretically important cases that might help me extend and hone my theory of role exit. For instance, most of the roles people exit are achieved roles or roles they've taken active steps to occupy that were not given to them, like student or spouse. However, people do on occasion exit ascribed roles or roles that people occupy based on characteristics mostly beyond their control, such as gender and race. Now, if I were to sample, for example, those who've left their gender role because of uh, sex reassignment surgery, my theory would be more complete because I could account for existing, uh, for exiting, excuse me, both achieved and ascribed roles. Purposes of sampling ends once the researcher reaches a point of theoretical saturation, which is the point in which sampling more cases teaches the researcher a little to nothing new about the particular research question. When theoretical saturation will occur is very hard to predict. You have to play it by ear, so to speak, and analyze your data as you go, so that you will know when you've reached the point when you aren't learning anything new that every other interview that you do is teaching you less and less, sometimes nothing new about what you already know about what you're trying to find out about. Now, once a researcher reaches theoretical saturation, she can do one of three things. The first is to just stop and start analyzing the data and write up the results. In-depth interview projects or any scientific projects, quite frankly, are never done, they are just over. That is, at some point in the research project, you have to just sit down and write up the results of what you found. Of course, your results may be limited in their scope and leave many questions unanswered, but that's just the nature of science itself. No research project, however massive, ever answers all the questions about a particular research subject once and for all. Sometimes you just have to come to terms that you are just one person with a limited amount of resources and time, and thus there is only so much you can do. You also have to trust that what you have to say is valuable, even if it is limited in scope. Second thing you can do once you've reached theoretical saturation is start sampling different sorts of cases that might inform the research question. As I previously stated, purpose of sampling is, ve is a very flexible type of sampling design because it allows you to change the cases you sample as you carry out a research project. In many in-depth interview projects, you begin by sampling particular types of people. However, what you learn from these people opens up new areas of inquiry that interviewing other people can answer. 
don't be afraid to follow the leads that arise in the course of the project because often these leads bear the most theoretical fruit. And the third thing you can do once you reach a point of theoretical saturation is to seek out what we call negative cases. Negative cases are cases that challenge your thinking about the phenomenon in which you are interested. Negative cases are those that seem to contradict what you think is going on. Often negative cases can teach you a lot about what is going on because they point out factors that are important that you haven't even considered. In other words, seeking out negative cases helps you hone the theory that you develop with the data gathered with the purpose of sample. For example, let's say you're studying how workers at a homeless shelter manage the negative emotions they experience on the job. Say that everyone seems to manage their emotions in the same way, except this one person. This one person would be the negative case, and you would want to really explore this case in detail to figure out the reasons why this case doesn't fit into your particular patterns that you found for all the other cases. By doing this, you can figure out factors that are important for your analysis that you might have missed beforehand. For example, this person may manage his emotions in an entirely different way than others because he experiences different types of negative emotions than everyone else and thus has to manage them in a different way. Or because he has access to particular emotion management strategies that others do not because of his gender or his socioeconomic status. Now, even if you've decided to use a purpose of sampling design and know the types of people that you want to include in the sample, there is still the issue of getting these people to participate in your research. In other words, there is the issue of recruitment. There are several strategies you can use to recruit people to participate in your research projects. The use of one or more of these strategies often depends on the substantive frame and empirical nature of your research project. First, you can use your own personal social networks to recruit participants. Many qualitative social scientists have used this strategy. For example, Patricia and Peter Adler did an in-depth interview study of high-end drug dealers, and they began recruiting participants by asking a neighbor who they knew was a drug dealer uh, to participate in their research. If you all taking, uh, listening to this lecture right now were doing a research project on college experiences or something of that nature, you could use your own personal social networks to recruit, since many in your social networks right now are college students. Second, you can place flyers on message boards, websites, bulletin boards, Craigslist, other public announcement forums. This helps get the word out about your research project and you'd be surprised how many people this strategy will help you recruit. You often want to use this strategy if the people you are trying to sample are dispersed and don't necessarily have any interactions with one another. For instance, one study used flyers to recruit people to participate in a study of biracial college students. College students who are biracial don't necessarily hang out with one another and there usually isn't some place or meeting group where biracial students congregate. In other words, biracial college students are dispersed. Thus, using flyers was one of the only feasible options to recruit these types of people for the study. Third, you can go to meetings and organizations where the people you want to interview congregate. Um, you know, for instance, say I want to do an in-depth interview study of people who live with HIV. To recruit people into my study, I could sit in on an HIV support group, tell them about my research, and hopefully recruit from there. Fourth, you can ask gatekeepers to help you recruit. Gatekeepers are the people who are in charge of formal organizations whose say-so gives you access to the organization. For instance, a principal would be a gatekeeper of a high school, a pastor would be a gatekeeper at a church, and a shelter coordinator would be the gatekeeper of a domestic violence shelter. We'll talk more about gatekeepers when we talk about gaining access to fieldwork sites. But if there are, are people in a formal organization who you need to interview for your project, you often have to get the permission of a gatekeeper to do so. Moreover, gatekeepers will often help you recruit participants for your study. Gatekeepers sponsoring your research through 
through their recruiting efforts will also make you seem more trustworthy in the eyes of potential participants. Fifth, you can ask an informant or someone on the inside, so to speak, to help you recruit. An informant is someone you meet who gives you the lowdown, so to speak, on what's going on and can vouch for you to others. Informants can direct you to the people you need to talk to. Moreover, having an informant to vouch for you often causes others to trust you who might not otherwise. For instance, if I wanted to do an in-depth interview study of street gang members, I could try to find a street gang member who trusted me and would vouch for me. If I could find this one informant, this would greatly facilitate recruitment of potential participants. Finally, you can use what's called snowballing. Snowballing is when you ask people you've already talked to if they know anybody else you could interview. Often people who are in the same boat, so to speak, know each other, and you can use uh, this fact to recruit other participants. For instance, say I'm doing an in-depth interview research project investigating the experience of transgendered people. After conducting an interview with one transgendered person, I would ask this person if he or she knew of any other transgendered people that I could interview and give them my contact information to give to these other people that so that so I could potentially recruit them. And once you've found the people to recruit for your study, there are several things you can do to help ensure their participation. First, you should tell the participants up front what the study is about, why you want to interview them, and about how long it will take. Being forthright about why you want to interview a person can help you gain trust, and people who trust you are more likely to participate than those that don't trust you. Second, try to make potential participants feel like they're doing you a favor, which in fact they are by taking the time out of their days to be interviewed. People like doing favors for other people, and potential participants are no exception. Third, you can try to convey to them how your study will help people like them. Again, people like to help other people, and if potential participants believe that your study will help people like themselves in the future, they are usually more willing to participate. Fourth, you should let the participants choose the times and locations where they want to be interviewed. Doing the interviews at a time and place that is convenient for the participants will make it more likely that they will show up for the interview. You have to be very flexible with your time and where you are willing to do an interview in this regard. Of course, this does have limits. Don't ever meet at a time and or a place in which you feel uncomfortable and or unsafe. Fifth, if you have access, you can use incentives to get people to participate, like monetary compensation or a meal. These little things help nudge somewhat unwilling people to actually participate. But overall, the best advice I can give for recruiting is to be persistent. Recruiting people to participate in your research projects can be a very trying task. Lots of things can and often will happen that will frustrate you. People say they will participate but don't show up. Gatekeepers won't return phone calls. Gatekeepers, when they do refuse phone calls, tell you no, right? Or you can't find an informant to vouch for you. These are challenges that most social scientists who conduct in-depth interview projects face. And the best advice I can give you is just to keep at it and don't give up. Okay, so that's all I had to say about uh, sampling and recruiting for in-depth interviews. Next time, we'll talk about... Um, creating in-depth interview guides. All right, thanks.